America is showing up in full force to vote early and in person in all 50 states, despite an alarming fall COVID surge. We still Americans, we have a responsibility. A lot of my friends back in 2016 didn't cast their votes, but this year, all of them registered and voted. There is nothing more important than this. Get out there and vote, 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 vote. They have the exits on the ground to make sure you're six feet apart. You get your temperature checked and you must wear a mask. I knew we would have to wait maybe three or four hours, but I didn't think we would be here all day. The wait is so long, there have been multiple reports of voters passing out due to dehydration. Someone's supposed to be comfortable voting when this line wraps around the entire building and there's maybe three feet of distance between everybody. What began as election night is quickly becoming election week. We're gonna have to be patient and it ain't over till every vote is counted. Millions and millions of people voted for us tonight. A very sad group of people is trying to disenfranchise that group of people. Stop that deal! Stop that deal! He is declaring them himself to be the winner of an election that he lost. Stop inspiring people to commit potential acts of violence. Someone's going to get hurt. Someone's going to get shot. Someone's going to get killed. I'm heading to the polls to attempt to vote. We only have one location in this area, so um, I attempted it four times yesterday, but I think I'm just gonna suffer through it. Going and growing. I think we're up to four, going on five rows back now. We have officially hit the one hour mark. We're still adding three more rows for people to vote. One of the first things I thought about when it became clear that this pandemic was not going anywhere and that we were going to be in lockdown for a long time was that people are voting this year and people are likely going to show up in record numbers. They're going to wait in close lines at the polls. They're going to stand near each other. They're going to breathe on each other. They're going to do all of these things to make sure their votes are cast. And this is a airborne pandemic and all of those things suddenly became dangerous. I mean, that really just changed the game. It changed how we cover elections. It changed how the campaigns actually campaigned. You know, the old traditional way of campaigning was shaking hands and kissing babies. And those are kind of the two things that were extremely not allowed uh, during a pandemic. The candidates had to figure out ways to operate a campaign completely virtually with very little time actually to set up a virtual campaign. So you had, you know, Biden, for example, setting up a TV studio in his basement where he could uh, talk to people, do TV interviews, and figure out ways to connect with voters who were sitting at home, possibly in their basements as well. You're not allowed to leave your home. Campaigning, <laughs> campaigning is all about really getting out there and get your message out there, shaking hands, kissing babies, all of those things. What's your plan? To, to try and convince the American people that you should be the next president of the United States whilst you're in your basement? By uh, trying to use and master the new technology out there. I can't get out. By March, we realized that the overwhelming majority of Americans were going to have to vote by mail for the first time ever. So it really made us have to totally rethink how we run elections in this country. Um, there were a number of states that were already good at running elections by mail, but some that had never done it before. So it wasn't just a question for voters about who they were going to vote for. It was a question about how they were actually going to vote in a pandemic. This was uh, one of the main areas where President Trump directed his conspiracy theories prior to the election. Without any evidence, he claimed that vote by mail was rigged. This information is actually a lot more likely to be believed when it comes directly from a trusted source. So like, for example, if you're a Republican, the president. And I'll tell you what, whether it's in North Carolina, whether it's in Michigan, whether it's in other states where they're sending out, they're gonna be sending out, they're gonna be sending out 80 million 
ballots, they're, and it's Democrats. They're gonna, they're trying to rig this election. And those talking points were repeated by other Republicans, and that's where we started seeing Democrats and Republicans dividing along ideological lines. People on both sides of the aisle worried that it would do damage to Republican and Democratic voters if they were concerned about mailing in their ballot and they were concerned about their health if they had to go cast a ballot in person would they decide not to vote at all? Long lines in the midst of a pandemic, at primaries in Wisconsin, Georgia, and at a Texas runoff election last month, have created an unprecedented call for mail-in ballots for this fall's general election. People could die from heat stroke. People can catch COVID. My preference would certainly be a mail-in ballot. The Postal Service is warning all 50 states in the District of Columbia that it can't ensure that mail-in ballots will be delivered in time to be counted this November. Unexpected changes have alarmed customers and postal workers. We do not have enough people to carry the mail. They're dismantling the post office before our eyes. I just don't trust the mail. I think the multi-prong attack that we were worried about began with the fundamental premise that there would be more mail-in voting in 2020 because of the pandemic than our country had seen before. And so casting doubt on the validity of that, casting doubt on the validity of results that might take a while to count, that laid the groundwork for what came next. Tonight, Postmaster General Louis DeJoy says it is outrageous to accuse him of trying to make it harder to cast a mail-in ballot. Louis DeJoy became Postmaster General in mid-June. Within 30 days after he came into office, he changed some of the policies on transportation, uh, on work hours, removing a lot of sorting machines. And he did it without any consultation with the big mailers, the mailing public, or any of the postal unions. Machines do come and go historically in the post office, uh, but the timing of during a pandemic, the timing of heading into an election where we knew tens of millions of more people were gonna vote by mail, it was gonna be the only way they would have access to the ballot box. And combined with this huge increase in packages due to the pandemic and, and people being sheltered in place. And the reality is the mail did slow down. Mail was delayed. There was a public outcry. We started to see in polling and anecdotally as well that people started to have a, a distrust in the postal service. I mean, immediate family and friends are calling me like, hey, Tamiko, you, can we mail this to the post office? Are you sure? Because I saw on social media. I'm walking over to the mailbox right now. I've waited a couple of days for this ballot to arrive. We filled it out over the phone on Monday. I was hoping it would get here by Wednesday. It is now Friday, October 30th, and I'm hoping the ballot is in the mail. Nothing. We talked to a lot of voters who were, you know, following social media videos about how to fill out their ballots correctly. Uh, they were telling us that they wanted to drop it off in person or at a drop box because they didn't trust the postal service because of all of the controversy and concerns with whether things would, would go out on time. So when I got to the post office the day before election day, so everything would be postmarked on time, one of the postal workers said that she could take my ballot and put it with any other absentee ballots and send it out. But there was no way to track it, so I just didn't want to take the chance. I decided to do Overnight Express, which was $30. I didn't want to pay for my vote, but this was too important not to be able to track it to make sure it at least got there. This is my receipt with the tracking number right here and guaranteed delivery by election day by three o'clock. So one thing that we saw this year that we hadn't seen before was people discussing the fact that you could actually track your ballot so you could see if your application for your mail-in ballot had been received, if it had been mailed to you, if your vote had been counted. There were two false narratives coming all the way from the highest office of the land about vote by mail. One was that it's fraudulent, corrupt, uh, and is going to cause an election to be rigged. And the other was that somehow the Postal Service and postal workers did not have the capacity to move the extra ballots that were expected during a COVID pandemic. All the facts say the opposite. Oregon has had vote by mail for 19 years. Everybody's vote is cast through the mail, 100 million plus ballots cast, 15 cases of voter fraud, less than one per year. 
some point in 2020, we actually had to change our messaging, even though we strongly preferred for people to vote by mail for health reasons. Uh, we realized that there had been a partisan attack on the USPS, which meant that it was possible that people weren't going to be able to vote by mail. So we pivoted to suggesting that people vote early. And so we were ready to pivot quickly with our messaging, saying if you haven't received your absentee ballot application yet, you can also vote in person. Be prepared, be ready. But part of our messaging had to include be safe. As this crisis was hitting, it was exposing so much of the inequities that exist um, in our healthcare system, in our economy. The virus spread like wildfire through uh, prisons and jails and then back into communities of color, layering on top of COVID and, and hurting communities even further. And then these videos started to appear. remember when that George Floyd video hit my screen. I, that eight minute video where the police officer had his knee on George Floyd's neck. The, the video of those men chasing down Ahmaud Arbery. Breonna Taylor, as we were clapping outside of our windows for essential workers, this young woman who was an essential worker in her own home, not even safe in her own home. Who do you protect? Who do you serve? Who do you protect? All of those moments, not just were moments where we had to respond, but we had to emotionally like deal with the fact that we were seeing ourselves, seeing our family members reflected in those videos. And so this is, this is a sound of people saying enough is enough, that we are being murdered. It plays out that then we are not seen as human beings by law enforcement, right? And by the people who are on paper supposed to protect us and care for us uh, as, as, as citizens. And that was our opportunity. That was our moment to connect, stay in the streets, right? Take whatever measure um, feels right for you to make sure your voice is heard, but include voting as one of your tools. Include voting as a part of your overall strategy and analysis for transforming our government. We are about to go vote. I said, I said. So on October 26th, when Maryland announces their early voting has started, I literally texted my sister. I was like, hey, we're going to vote early. <laughs> my family, my sister, my fiance, and all of my friends felt like our voices hasn't been heard. Being an Asian LGBTQ um, American, sometimes we feel like we don't belong. Sometimes we feel like our leaders are not listening to us. And there is so much happening in the world right now, you know, with coronavirus and people not wearing masks and people are making fun of people wearing a mask. And I feel like we're so divided right now to where you can't even publicly support who you want to support. That is why this election is so, so important. It's everything that we value, everything that we love, everything that we stand for, everything that we fight for is on the ballot this year. After the pandemic hit, it really kind of put into stark view what issues people cared about. And as we saw through the course of the campaign, the top issues became the pandemic and the economy. I'm not a political guy. I don't. I only got involved in politics at this very like rudimentary level because this is government's purpose is to help us during times of crisis. We lost like $23,000 in the month of November. And right now we're doing the worst numbers we've seen so far. Like we did eight people on Sunday, eight. There are more people working inside than we did of people coming in to eat. If we don't have people inside. How do I pay for servers, bartenders, bussers, runners? Like, how do I pay for those people? You're looking at a generation of people in, in the restaurant industry that aren't going to have a job. You know, I don't think people realize, like, I hold myself responsible to everybody that is underneath me. And they look to me for money. You know, I'm looking to our Mitch McConnell's, our Nancy Pelosi's to be the ones that help small business out. You guys get paid to figure it out. Get in a room and figure it out because the rest of us over here are, are, are fighting and dying. It's election eve. We've got about one hour before the polls close. And it
and we're riding the city streets of Santa Fe, New Mexico. And the Republicans here in Santa Fe have been working hard to push their agenda, the American First agenda, to support our president and to make America great again. And the one group of people that we want to appreciate and honor and show our support more than probably any other group in America today is the great men and women of law enforcement right here. How are y'all doing? Good. Good. Tonight, the race is over and the counting begins. It's democracy in action as America decides. Think around 100,000 ballots still to come. We get word that we will get more reporting from them tomorrow. So we're standing by for that, okay? And of course, in the, in the state generally, we've had to break out the decimal points here. Right? Because of late arriving mail votes and how close this race is, it could be some time before we see decisive results. Americans generally expect to learn the results of an election either late the night of election day or the next morning. I, like everyone else, had heard repeatedly before the election that we were not gonna know the winner of the presidential race on election night on Tuesday night. But as a country that's so used to tuning into cable news and having the media project the winner at the end of election day, I myself was still anxious waiting result. I think everyone was. Four in the morning, 420, I turned the TV on. You're still counting votes. So it's 10 o'clock and it's still very uncertain. This is getting very nervous. Oh my God. It's a win in Georgia, it's a win in North Carolina, it's a win in Pennsylvania, it's a win in Michigan. This is. I feel like in here, my chest. It's a bad feeling. If my therapist wasn't also having uh, their own moment, with uh, watching the election returns, I would have probably called them uh, a couple of times because we were all having these moments of watching the returns and waiting and wondering. And days would go by and we were waiting and wondering. The presidency mm -hmm. hangs in the balance as the votes continue to be counted, especially in those key battleground states across the country. It is too early to call the race right now or project the race, but right now, Democratic nominee Joe Biden appears to have a narrow lead over President Trump in the fight for those 270 electoral college votes. Here's the problem. The president has already falsely declared victory and fraud. He did that overnight. He also threatened to drag the race all the way to the Supreme Court. Listen. This is a fraud on the American public. This is an embarrassment to our country. We were getting ready to win this election. Frankly, we did win this election. Yeah, Donald Trump did, in fact, declare himself the winner on election night. The president's aim was to, kind of knowing that some of these other states would take a while to count ballots, was to immediately claim that those ballots that were counted after election day were fraudulent. Mail-in ballots, at least in some states, can't be counted before election day. And despite advocacy in 2020 to change that, some states resisted changing it. So that meant you had thousands and thousands of ballots building up. In addition to getting right the ballots being cast on election day itself, it just takes time. And of course, this is an area where you do not want to sacrifice accuracy for speed. You want to get the count right. You know, we saw it in Pennsylvania, we saw it in Georgia, we saw it in North Carolina, we saw it in Nevada, we saw it in Arizona. People were counting for a week. And I think it was really frustrating for a lot of local election officials to hear all of these rumors and misinformation swirling about fraud when they were literally just counting ballots. We are going to defend the honesty of the vote by ensuring that every legal ballot is counted and that no illegal ballot is counted. So we were reporting outside the Pennsylvania Convention Center, which was where election workers were counting all the ballots for Philadelphia. Uh, on one side, we saw uh, supporters of the president chanting, stop the steal. And on the other side, you had uh, demonstrators saying, count every vote. 
you know, think about how vague Stop the Steal is. It's just a claim. It doesn't say who was doing the stealing, how it was stolen, you know, what it would take to sort of uh, reveal this so-called steal. So when we were communicating with voters, we were, you know, leaning into the messaging that everything's okay, the process is working, count every vote. Uh, that became like the nationwide message for all of the people who are interested in a secure uh, and transparent democracy. Georgia uh, ended up doing a statewide audit, which they had planned to do originally. Uh, they ended up doing a hand recount, and over and over again, the same results came forth, which were that Biden won the state of Georgia. When it became apparent that Biden won, the president started attacking the election officials in Georgia, who are Republicans. It's the idea that we didn't know on the night of November 3rd exactly who had won, the idea that mail-in ballots had been a higher percentage of votes cast, the idea that media outlets had made certain predictions based on their number crunching. None of that amounted to genuine fraud. None of that amounted to wrongdoing, malfeasance. It was a red mirage and then a blue wave. More Republicans voted in person and more Democrats voted by mail. Everyone was waiting for Pennsylvania to be called because that was the state that would end up putting Biden over the edge. Um, and so Pennsylvania was called on the Saturday after Election Day. CBS News projects that Joe Biden has been elected the 46th president of the United States. The kid from Scranton becomes the next leader of the free world. I remember when the election was called. All I could hear was horns and people cheering and yelling. My building sort of exploded in noise. We're so excited. We're so excited. America spoke. We won. We won. Despite how hard it was to vote this year, we saw not just record-breaking turnout, record-shattering turnout. I don't think we've ever seen turnout this high. 65% of the voting eligible population cast ballots during the single hardest like year to vote ever means it's only, we're only gonna go up from here. Also, Americans saw that our local election officials pulled off this Herculean task. At the same time, there are some Americans there, we've just lost them to conspiracy. You can't dump millions of envelopes in neighborhoods, thousands of envelopes in neighborhoods. They, they sort piles of stuff and people just pick them up and do whatever they and want. And then drop boxes. I, I just... mean, that's our whole election system and our, whole, our country is really under attack. They got a lot of illegal people voting, millions probably of illegal people voting. There are people that said they, they received four or five ballots in the mail. I mean, that's, that's just crazy. Um, well, we know there was many, many people that voted that were like 120, 100, <laughs> <laughs> like a lot of dead people voted. Really, it's just assertion after assertion in which, uh, you know, electoral officials in various states counted votes that shouldn't have been counted, or they didn't count votes that should have been counted, or they didn't let poll watchers from one side you know, stand close enough to the counting process. Again, it's, it's another one of these conspiracy theories that I really don't put any stock in at all because there's simply nothing behind it. Twitter, for the very first time, is fact-checking the president. This is what Twitter did. Uh, the company added a link to uh, one of his tweets that has a little quote, quote there, get the facts. Well, one of the chief critics, as you know, of mail-in voting is the president of the United States. On your own platform in May, he says, there is no way, zero in caps, that mail-in ballots will be anything less than substantially fraudulent. In June, rigged 2020 election, millions of mail-in ballots will be printed by foreign countries and others. Be the scandal of our times. July, the 2020 election will be rigged if mail-in voting allowed to take place. We could go on and on. So how are you handling the president of the United States to let, let him know and let the people who are using your platform that this is misinformation, is it not? I certainly think that anyone who's saying that the election is going to be fraudulent, um, I think that that's problematic. And I think additional context needs to be added to that. I think social media platforms can do a lot to curb disinformation. Uh, one, one thing they have done is during the 2020 campaign, they've uh, flagged content that has been uh, disputed or that's outright false, including some pieces of content posted by the president himself. In some cases, it said, oh, well, this claim is disputed or official sources called this differently. 
Um, and so I think that's kind of one level of doing this. Another way is to simply say this is flat out false, right? We've got evidence or there is no evidence of this at the very minimum. So yeah, they censored. I mean, they, they if you took surveys on any social media, um, they were skewed. If you took, if you, people that were sharing certain things, like if you shared at one point anything that was about COVID, you got bumped off the, the platform. So I believe that the censoring was absolutely one-sided. We want to put stuff on Facebook. We have to think it over. We got to scrub it. We got to, you know, and, and make sure and certain things we just can't mention at all. You know, even if it has nothing to do with stuff, it's just certain words, buzzwords and, you know, you can't even talk, I, I, I can't even talk about spades. It's a, it's a Trump card, up, oh, and flagged. <laughs> and it'll be this big thing, boom. You know, the AP said uh, Joe Biden won the election. Okay, we're not even talking about that. Yeah, there are a number of, of, of uh, you know, social media platforms uh, from which people who feel that they are being discriminated against by so-called big tech, uh, then depart those plat depart uh, the well-known platforms like Twitter and Facebook and go to these alternative platforms where there is less, if any, censorship. Yeah, we both are like all over it all the time. Twitter, Parler, YouTube, Gab, Rumble, BitChute. <laughs> you know, there's information out there. It's just like General Flynn says that we're digital soldiers. It's sad that the platforms are censoring us, but that's how information gets exchanged. We're trying to avoid all that. So yeah, but at the same time, you know, it can get dark. It can get dark too, you know, dark, uh, you know, so we have to bring to the light. That's why that stuff has to be mainstream because then if it's in the shadows, shadowy things happen in the shadows, you know? What do you mean it can get dark? What are you referring to? Well then, you know, if, if it's, the you know, the, the, the white supremacists, there are white supremacists. And so this is something that we've been dealing with in deep, ways um, at the social media platforms. The platforms uh, are wired uh, to actually um, spread misinformation and disinformation. Donald Trump um, uh, spreading misinformation about vote by me and um, watching as Facebook didn't pull down posts that clearly violated the four corners of their policies. Have you personally engaged with the president, Mark, about his posts? on this particular topic? I, I don't think recently. Um, I, I have had certain discussions with him in, in the past and where I've, where I've told him that I, I thought some of the, the rhetoric um, was, was problematic. If I did talk to him, um, you know, be clearer about how, uh, you know, just the, the importance of, of making sure that people have confidence in the election. We've watched as people have twisted themselves into pretzels to defend lies, to defend mistruth with a straight face because it earns them a dollar or keeps them in power. We spend time trying to expose a problem. They tell us the problem doesn't exist. At some point, some investigative journalism piece comes out that exposes it. They quickly tell us that they have a solution. Then um, something else happens and we realize that, that either the solution was never designed to fix the problem or the solution um, was not enforced. The misinformation itself was extremely confusing because it was all over the place. That all over the place strategy also kind of led to Trump's litigation, which was also all over the place and didn't seem to have any consistent theme other than question as many ballots as you can and try and delegitimize uh, the vote counts in places where you're losing, in places where a lot of Democrats voted, in places where a lot of black people voted. First of all, obviously he's not, he's not gonna concede when at least 600,000 ballots are in question. How can I possibly tell you there's fraud or no fraud? The company counting our vote with control over our vote is owned by two Venezuelans who were allies of Chavez, are present allies of Maduro, with a company whose chairman is a close associate and business partner of George Soros. I find this unprecedented. We have certainly seen in this country post-election litigation before. But it hasn't been like this. There are dozens and dozens of challenges being filed in courts across the country without facts or laws underneath them. In some cases, challenging votes that wouldn't even come close to changing the Electoral College votes in a single state, let alone the results of the election nationwide, and therefore seem to be 
getting filed and pursued more as part of a disinformation campaign than any credible attempt to change the outcome of the election. Any campaign has the opportunity to challenge election results through legal avenues. Um, so a lot of people have been saying that the president has been within his rights to make legal challenges. The problem for the president, however, is that none of these legal challenges have passed muster with the courts. There's a saying among lawyers that if you don't have good facts, argue the law, and if you don't have good law, argue the facts. The problem for Trump's election lawsuits is he has neither the facts nor the law. He doesn't have the facts to make out the claims of fraud that his lawyers are insisting on but not substantiating, and he doesn't have law on his side that it would uh, allow courts to step in and order the sort of remedies that he's asking for, like wholesale jettisoning of results in particular states or demanding of, of recounts in states. And there's nothing wrong with saying that, you know, uh, that you've recalculated. Well, Mr. President, the challenge that you have is the data you have is wrong. All I want to do is this. I just want to find uh, 11,780 votes. I can't understate, though, the importance of Georgia, uh, not just for what it means um, to the presidential election, for what it will mean also in terms of the control of Senate. We did not anticipate uh, the two U.S. Senate seats both being in a runoff. Um, and so we had to very quickly pivot uh, to have a, a secondary full scale civic engagement campaign. Pivoted from uh, make sure you vote in the fall and then we pivoted to stay patient, right? The results are coming, but stay patient. And then a week later we pivoted to we're going to do it again. The future of the U.S. Senate is at stake as Georgia voters head to the polls where they'll cast ballots in two key runoff elections. Senator David Perdue is facing off against John Ossoff and Senator Kelly Leffler is up against Reverend Raphael Warnock. There could be as many as 4 million people voting in this runoff race, which would be historic for a runoff where we traditionally see those numbers uh, drop. In the general election here in Georgia, there were about 5 million voters, and that set a record for the state. One, one, two, three. <laughs> Tonight, the eyes of the nation are on Georgia, and it's two runoffs that will decide which party controls the United States Senate. At this hour, CBS News characterizes both races as toss-ups. It was probably like seven or eight years ago. I was having breakfast with my friend Stacey Abrams of Georgia. And I remember Stacey saying that they were building the infrastructure to really uh, turn Georgia blue, to make sure they were gonna fight against voter suppression and push back and, and really turn out. They could build multiracial coalitions. CBS News projects that both Democrats have won those two seats. Really an extraordinary development. I am honored, honored by your support, by your confidence, by your trust. The 82 year old hands that used to pick somebody else's cotton went to the polls and picked her youngest son to be a United States Senator. Our democracy doesn't work unless everyone, all eligible citizens, uh, can and do participate in it. Voter engagement is something that takes years and it requires trust. No state should be written off. Ultimately, if we want to expand our democracy to truly be representative of all eligible and registered citizens, then that work takes time and it's not overnight and it requires seeing people not as votes, but as whole people. So there are many stars this election cycle that rose up, that, that, that built infrastructure, that built the vehicles and organization which helped fight against voter suppression. Um, there was the work in the courts, yes, but there was the work on the ground to expose it, to fight back. It came down to communities that are oftentimes ignored during presidential elections, actually moving to the forefront, being part of a powerful audience that will dictate elections moving forward. We saw a lot of young people voting. We saw record numbers of people of color voting. You ready to vote? Yeah. Woo! I'm trying to vote for the fourth time. Um, or fifth time, I've lost count. Yay, we just finished voting. I've got my stickers, so does Alexa. People were like, I know it's hard to vote, 
I know you're trying to make it even harder for me to vote and I'm going to vote anyway. And so there are all these people who had missed many elections and they voted this year. Something that gives me hope is that this was determined to be the most secure election that we've had. So all of the concerns heading into this election about how to conduct an election in a pandemic, um, it seems like states really learned how to do it. I'm less optimistic about the ability for this country to come together. I think this election showed how divided this country really is and how people can't even agree on a set of facts. This information is a threat to democracy uh, for a number of reasons. I think that uh, democracies rely upon a shared bed of facts to be able to proceed in any orderly fashion. And so uh, for people to agree on the facts when they're trying to legislate to decide which laws to pass and which not to pass is incredibly important. And to be able to come to compromise uh, in places where people disagree. Uh, and I think that's becoming a lot more difficult when uh, one side in particular has chosen to ignore the uh, uh, widely acknowledged facts in favor of fantasies. I think it makes governance harder, it makes the kind of trust that enables compromise harder, um, and I think it, uh, it just sort of drives uh, Americans further apart. We will never give up, we will never concede. We're coming for you, and we're gonna have a good time doing it. Let's have trial by combat. From us. They don't get to tell us we didn't see what we saw. Where is your head? Where's your head? No. 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 The government did this to us. We were normal, good, law-abiding citizens, and you guys did this to us. We want our country back. We are witnessing history and what can only be described as a national disgrace. As we come on the air, the U.S. Capitol is under lockdown after violent mobs, stoked and encouraged by the words of President Trump and his allies, stormed the building while the House and Senate were in session. They were meeting to count the votes of the Electoral College. All of this because President Trump has refused to accept that he lost the election and has falsely told his supporters that it was stolen from him. What happened here today was an insurrection incited by the President of the United States. Those who choose to continue to support his dangerous gambit by objecting to the results of a legitimate democratic election will forever be seen as being complicit in an unprecedented attack against our democracy. The best way we can show respect for the voters who are upset is by telling them the truth. You know, ultimately, the democratic experiment is, it's an act of faith, right? It's an act of faith on the part of a, a collective populace that we can resolve our differences non-violently through collective choice and through voting ultimately that uh, in whose results we trust and the outcome of which we accept. We need to get that faith back.